world leaders engage in climate talks as COP26 is underway in Glasgow. A local business is nominated for a prestigious award and a look into the not so perfect world of depression in dogs. Hello, I'm Tom Hooker and welcome to Winchester News Online. It's the second day of COP26 in Glasgow and many world leaders and parties have already been in attendance. The UK government has committed to its saying of keeping 1.5 alive. However, after I spoke to Jeremy Corbyn yesterday, he said that the government isn't doing enough to fund a green industrial revolution. Alistair English has more on the story. So, I'm with Simon Owen from Fox News. Simon, uh, what's the atmosphere like in Glasgow at the moment? I would say there's a bit of tension in the air because you've got thousands upon thousands of people who have traveled from all over the world and are kind of racing around this vast convention center. A lot of these people are really concerned about climate change, about the impact it's having. The, the conference sort of started with a mood of pessimism. You know, even the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who is so in a, a bullion normally, was pretty down on, 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 on where the conference was heading in terms of what world leaders might agree to. So I think there is a bit of tension in the air as people wait to see what the negotiators will thrash out over the next 10 days or so. Yeah, uh, what are um, the big issues leaders are hoping to address at COP26? A, a lot has been made here of who's not here. So President Biden of the US is here, but the Chinese president isn't, the Russian president isn't, and that kind of casts a bit of a downer on the whole thing. If you've got these huge emitters who haven't even bothered to, to show up, are they really taking it that seriously? At the same time, the Indian prime minister is here, and for the first time yesterday, he made quite a lot of news because Narendra Modi committed to a date by which India will go net zero. On the other hand, the date he set was 2070. And the aim of this conference was to get countries to commit to 2050. So, you know, that's, you don't need to be an expert in maths to know that's a full 20 years behind the target that the, country, that the British were hoping for. So at this early stage, it's very much up in the air as to whether these various aims are going to be successful. But I can tell you that today, you know, we've heard from, from a number of countries and President Biden has, has fronted this, this announcement, a hundred countries that have signed up to halt deforestation by 2030. And that includes the US, but it also includes Brazil, China, Indonesia. Yeah, going back to the um, in India situation, how important is it that their um, net zero target is 20 years further ahead, well, later than the rest of um, COP26? The fact that it's 20 years, I think that I mean, is going to be seen as, as a blow. Years, Narendra Modi is not somebody who is easily pushed around. And he has said that he's standing on the stage here and he believes he's speaking for a lot of smaller developing countries. And they have a, 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 an argument here where, where they say that you know, this isn't just the case of you don't just say when you're going to get to net zero. There's a whole load of other stuff you've got to do as well. What are you going to do about your energy sources? What are you going to do about deforestation, methane emissions? There's, there's, there's just a really broad range of, of discussions to be had. And one of them is how much money should developed rich countries like Britain and the US give to developing countries like India and other smaller nations to help them with the transition to going green. Because India, India's argument is that, you know, you look to the West and it's gone through the industrial revolution. It's spent decades and or centuries pumping out huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. And the developing world had nothing to do with that. And now that the developing world is developing and pumping out huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, they sort of see that as their turn to come up their time to rise. And so part of Narendra Modi's case here is that, yes, this deadline is not what the Brits had hoped for and, and, and various others in the West. But he's also saying that, look, you need to match this by, by turning around to us and giving some money to support poorer countries as they go through this green transition. And in fairness to him, rich countries did agree more than 10 years ago that they would give a lot of money to helping poorer countries with the transition. And by all accounts, that money has not been forthcoming. Simon so, Owen, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, that's all we've got time for. Thanks, thank Alistair. Thanks for having me. The Student Switch Off is a campaign which encourages students to save electricity when living in halls of residence by doing small tasks such as turning off the lights, taps and heating. 
Every year around 50,000 students across Europe and the UK take part and last year they were able to save enough electricity to power a light bulb for 8,300 years. The flat which saves the most electricity across the year wins uh, tickets to the Summer Bowl. So far we've had um, a few hundred students in halls of residence sign up to support the campaign, so pledging to take um, sustainable actions whilst living in halls of residence. And so we've got a few students trained up as volunteers who are going to be promoting the campaign in halls, um, but we're hoping to get more people signed up as, as volunteers. There are 120 student volunteers across 35 universities in the UK, but only three in the University of Winchester. They go to meetings such as this to learn more about the climate crisis and their role in leading the 58,000 students who have pledged their support this year in fulfilling sustainable actions. But um, I know I'm, when I go back after this I'm going to go and talk to my flat and see if I can get more people to try and become volunteers and just talk about the little things like leaving the lights off at night because I know the amount of times I've walked in first thing in the morning and all the lights have been left on from the night before and it is all the small things that we need to do. They stand by the belief that the smallest actions, like remembering to turn off the lights, go the longest way, as these small actions were able to save 335 tonnes of CO2 in last year's campaign and look to save even more this year with more people having taken the pledge. This is Kurt Hill from Winchester News Online. Next, Anisti Business has reached the final three of a national military award. Ben Morris investigates. During the coronavirus pandemic, everything, as we know, was done online, meaning that it was more difficult to view houses. However, a company from Italy has overcome this by creating a platform where you can view houses on streets like this, on devices like this. Virtually creates a 3D image of a house that can be explored with a click of a button, much like Google Earth. The company was started by Olivia Harris, who was supported by X-Forces Enterprise due to her grandfather's involvement with the Parachute Regiment. She said she saw a gap in the market. The enterprise provides business training, funding and support for ex-military and their families. Olivia told me what it meant to be nominated. It's just crazy to be honest with you. I didn't expect, you know, Bachelor to grow as much as it has over the past two years. Um, we've had substantial growth, which has been amazing. Um, and to be, you know, obviously recognised by X Forces for that is is great. So um, I would say to any young entrepreneur that wants to start their business is just to ignore anybody that will plant a seed of doubt in your mind. Um, there will always be a reason not to do something. So you just got to go ahead and do it anyway. Um, just believe in yourself and just keep keep plugging away because it, it, it will take off if you you know put put enthusiasm into it and, and a lot of hard work the company was nominated and made the final three of the national soldiering on awards ben morris winchester news online the long-awaited plans for the redevelopment of the saint clement surgery were unveiled recently and winchester news online got an exclusive first glimpse at the at the proposals as Torin bud reports The plans for the redevelopment and relocation of Winchester's St. Clement's surgery were unveiled last week, with a private presentation being hosted before the venue was opened to the public and current patients of the surgery. So Ashura is a medical centre investor, developer and owner. Um, so I sit in the development team at Ashura. We build, we build GP surgeries across the country, such as the one you can see here today. Um, what we do as an organisation is work with GPs in existing buildings that aren't fit for purpose and um, buy sites, get planning, construct, build and then own um, GP surgery. Looking at developing something that's sort of fit for the future, that incorporates people uh, being able to be consulted with digitally, remotely or being seen in person, trying to obviously take into account people who are with disabilities so there's lots of access, um, you know, really good access for people with, 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 with needs, whether that's hearing impairment or dementia or um, disability vehicles or whatever. Those in attendance were very vocal about the plans and were invited to leave feedback about the developments. The building's great. But my reservation is that that facade looks a bit like a toilet, you know, like the yellow bricks, the Andover one, low courts. Whereas if you made it like a, an off-white orange, then it would make, would be best. It's absolutely 
wonderful. But most buildings, we don't know how they work until we're actually in them. So there has to be room for flexibility and change of plans, but most of all, can it be built and finished without any more hassle. The project that has been long through by the community for some time now will begin construction in spring next year. And after 15 months, we'll open its doors in summer 2023. Time that, Winchester News Online. And now here's Kayleigh with the latest update on the coronavirus. The current numbers for COVID cases have increased overall, both locally and nationally. In Hampshire, the number of cases has increased by 1,358 since last week. As a result, areas of the community have taken precautions to protect themselves. Southampton University have sent out an order to their staff and students to wear masks on campus, effective immediately. And secondary school pupils have been told to do asymptomatic tests as they come back from the half term, even if they have no symptoms. However, primary schools and nurseries don't have to do a test if they show no symptoms. Despite the concerning rise of confirmed cases, there has only been one COVID-associated death in the local area in the past week, while half the population over the age of 12 in Hampshire has been double jabbed. Weatherspoons recorded its biggest loss during COVID. Fithia Sassenthal Ma visited the pub to interview the manager. recorded its biggest loss after the business suffered heavily from the COVID-19 restrictions. I wanted to get a, bit of, a little bit of an insight on how, how COVID has affected the business and their staff. So we've had lots of different regulations put into place, such as we still have some of the uh, dividers up now. So before COVID, the pub had quite a different layout, so that was one of the things that changed. Uh, another major change was the way we interacted with customers. We weren't really allowed to stand around and chat to them anymore. We were only allowed to serve them and that was about it, which made it quite difficult for lots of regulars. Uh, sales went down a lot and caused quite a lot of people to end up leaving the company or they would be on furlough that wasn't really you know, providing enough money for them to live on. I myself didn't get a lot of money during furlough, so I really felt that. And then also coming when we reopened after the lockdowns, it was sort of every other day there'd be a new regulation in place, so that became quite difficult as well, as well as crowd control and also some repercussions from outside viewers seeing how busy it would be in here, we'd face the backlash for it. After having suffered quite a bit due to COVID, the pub is now running smoothly. All the staff are working their usual hours and the customers have no problem with going in and, jo and enjoying a drink or two. The autumn budget was released last week. We sent Oliver McLennan to explain what it is and how it affects Winchester. The autumn budget was released recently, outlining the government's plan for a post-COVID economy. Some of the key points include the rise in minimum wage, which Rishi Sunak says will benefit over 2 million people across the country. With Winchester being the least affordable city to live in, according to a Halifax report, this could be a huge boost to the city. Another big point in the budget is the change to alcohol. Under this new system, drinks with a lower alcohol content will have less tax, making it the biggest beer tax cut in 50 years. And this is just the tip of the iceberg for the government's plans, with changes to come to universal credit, courts, schools and more set to be implemented in the coming months. I'm Oliver McLennan, Winchester News Online. And finally, Cameron Cornell has the latest news from around Winchester. Major UK supermarkets including Tesco, Sainsbury's and Aldi are issuing warnings to customers over possible health risks. Food allergies, incorrect packaging and choking hazards are among the reasons behind a number of recalled products. All the companies affected have advised customers to return items, offering refunds for bought products. A major refurbishment of the Winchester Discovery Centre is due to start next month. £715,000 will be invested following the decision to develop a new cultural hub in central Winchester. The centre is planned to reopen in spring 2022 with upgraded library facilities and improved gallery space. And the annual Winchester 10K run took place on Sunday 
with the event falling on Halloween this year. Despite the less than ideal weather, participants battled through a one lap route with a mixture of rural and urban landscape for runners to enjoy. The race was won by James Cher with a time of 32 minutes 58 seconds. That's all the news. Now over to Harry with the sport. Thanks, Tom. Southampton and Portsmouth both secured rare victories on Saturday afternoon, but how did Hampshire's various non league clubs fare at the weekend? Taylor Sinclair gives us the roundup. This weekend in the Build Best FA Trophy third round qualifier, AFC Totten picked up a 2 0 home victory against Dorchester Town, progressing through to the next round in impressive style by beating former boss Glenn Howes in what was interim manager Dan Sackman's first game in charge. Similarly, Eastleigh enjoy an impressive victory, avoiding a trick to earn themselves a treat against Maidenhead United with a 1-0 win, with Tyrone Barnett finding the back of the net at the first half. This moves the Spitfires into 12th in the table after 13 games in the National League. Fellow National League side, Aldershot Town FC were tricked on Halloween Eve by a Barnett side who won 2-1 late in the game at home. This leaves Aldershot struggling at the bottom of the table on 7 points after 13 games of the season. Lastly, Hampshire side Haven and Waterlooville competing in the National League South won 3-2 against Kelmsford City with a superb hat-trick from Jake McCarthy, scoring three goals in 11 minutes in the second half. This result means Havant and Waterlooville now sit 10th in the league, however now look forward to prepare for the upcoming first round FA Cup game against Charlton this weekend. The first round of the FA Cup is set to take place this weekend as Eastleigh FC travel to Boreham Wood. I'm now joined by one of our sports reporters, Michael Eilott, to discuss the side's chance of progressing. So, Michael, how do you think Eastleigh will fare? Well, I think it's a tough game, isn't it? They're playing top of the National League in, in Boreham Wood. And yeah, I think they sit in, sit in 12th place, Eastleigh, so in the mid-table. Um, however, they've, uh, they're unbeaten in their last three, I think, unbeaten against, against, against Boreham Wood. Wood. Yeah, Wood won so twice, drawn once. I think they'll have a bit of the sort of confidence factor going in. And I think at that level as well, it's very much sort of who turns up on their day. Um, Obviously, uh, they've, they've got experience as well of playing in the Cup before, um, and they've, they've won this weekend, haven't they, Eastleigh, against, against yeah, Maidenhead? Yeah, Maidenhead won nil this weekend, so they've got a bit of momentum going into it. Um, yeah, yeah. Got some danger men as well, Jake Hesketh has played in the Premier League before for Southampton. Yeah. Um, he's definitely a talent. He scored last round for Eastleigh as well. And I think as well on occasions like this, you sort of look to the sort of star players to sort of yeah, come up with the goods, the don't you? Just sort of, exactly. You want to you wanna have them at the scene, and I think in games like this, for, for non-league clubs such as Eastleigh and Boreham Wood, the cup is such a huge sort of point of interest. I mean, the league's important, um, but especially for travelling fans, with the opportunity of going further and further up the like up the pecking order, um, if they can get to sort of second or third round, as Eastleigh did, I think in 2016, 2016 they, they, they played uh, round, played yeah. Bolton. Bolton. They played Bolton. The they were exactly. Well, so yeah. championship. So imagine not just not just for the fans, but for the club financially, if they're going second, third round, where Premier League sides come in. Imagine if you had Eastleigh going to say Old Trafford or the Emirates Stadium, oh, taking a travelling support. It would be huge for the fans, a great day out, and huge for the club financially, especially recovering after COVID. Yeah, I mean, the situation's put so many non-league clubs on the brink of collapse, so mm. if Eastleigh can advance and beat Boreham Wood, which will be a tough test, mm. it will certainly help their chances of, um, of progressing as a club in the future. Exactly, and then who knows, a cup run can, can define someone's season, so uh, uh, I wish them all, all the best. Exactly. It's very exciting times for Eastleigh, so thanks a lot, Michael, for that. So now it's time to turn our attention to ice hockey, as the Basingstoke Bison have been in action over the past few weeks, hosting the Raiders and the Steel Dogs. Ed Brown has the story. The Bison hosted the Raiders on Saturday 23rd of October and the atmosphere was electric in the Basingstoke Arena. But the Raiders struck first, Piatek slusked home an early lead. The Raiders piled on the pressure, with Barry sniping in a second. The Bison woke up and responded, with two quick answers from Harding and Samford to tie the game. But Baldock put the Raiders back ahead in the second period, where tempers overflowed and even referees hit the ice. George Norcliffe powered home another equaliser, but the Bison fell behind again due to penalty controversy. In the dying seconds, Adrian Doughty slipped past the goalie, sending the game to overtime. And the Bison seized the opportunity. Adam Harding calmly stroked the winning goal past the keeper. Before the com coming at the third period, Everyone was ready to go, ready to work, and that's, that's what helped us push, push over the finish line. 
After losing away to the Telford Tigers on the 24th of October, the Bison welcomed the league leading Sheffield Steel Dogs to the arena. But yet again, the Bison fell behind early, Bissonette scoring for the Steel Dogs. The Bison fought back, Milton putting away an equaliser. The home crowd ruled on the Bison into the lead, Harding yet again scoring. The Steel Dogs tied it up late in the second, but Milton bagged his brace. But the Bison let off the gas and it showed, with Steel Dogs Thompson capitalising on a defensive blunder. The momentum was with the Steel Dogs and they capitalised, Hewitt scoring the winner. The Bison host the Bees this Saturday at the Basis Oak Arena. I'm Ed Brown, Winchester News Online. Winchester City have had a busy past seven days as they played the high-flying Froome Town last Tuesday before returning to the Charters Community Stadium at the weekend to host Slimbridge. Jude Richards was our reporter in Froome. Winchester City's promising start to the 2021-22 campaign was disrupted last Tuesday as they fell 2-0 to Froome Town. The visitors were dominated throughout the opening 45 minutes. However, it took until midway through the second period for the unbeaten Froome to break the deadlock. Winchester's night soon went from bad to worse as midfielder Matt Smith slotted into the bottom corner to seal Daniel Hoffman's side's fate and take the hosts up to second in the table. I mean, I'm not really looking at the league table. Um, I'm concentrating on our form and taking uh, one game at a time. I know it's cliche, but we are literally taking one game at a time um, and just trying to keep our performance levels where they are. After a resounding 5-2 victory in their last away outing, Winchester FC would have been keen to continue momentum as they faced Froome Town last Tuesday. However, that didn't quite go to plan. And this time, we'll see how they fare as they fell smokes from town this weekend. Drew Richards, Winchester News Online. After that disappointing 2-0 loss in midweek, Winchester City aimed to bounce back against a struggling Slimbridge side on Saturday afternoon. Our correspondent, Max Rumbolt, was there. The home side, Winchester FC, hosts away side, Slimbridge, in a tie expected to be full of goals, and both teams did not disappoint. However, despite a positive start to the match, Slimbridge found themselves 1-0 down after a perfectly improvised finish from Winchester's number 9. Winchester were quick to pounce again, making it 2-0, with striker Simba Malambo coming his second of the game. With City piling on the pressure, it became more likely that we would see another goal from the hosts. And after a poor kick from the Slimbridge keeper, it opened the opportunity for a counter-attack for C, in which they took advantage of, making it 3-0. With virtually the last kick of the game, Winchester grab a fourth, guaranteeing all three points. Max Rombolt, Winchester News Online. So that's all the sports coverage for the week. Here's Izzy with the entertainment. Good afternoon, I'm Izzy Higgs and this is your entertainment roundup. Ed Sheeran has a new album out, Equals, his fourth studio album was released on Friday and so far it's received mixed reviews. This is just a few weeks before Adele's highly anticipated album is released in mid-November. And spooky season is over, but we're still spinning after Strictly's Halloween week. Rose Ailing Ellis and her partner Giovanni Panisse made history as they received the earliest perfect score in the competition. The deaf actress has shown an impact on life outside the show as well. Google searches for sign language have gone up by over 400% since the start of her time in the ballroom. Rose took to Twitter to thank followers and direct them towards the best ways to learn. And now, on to a different kind of dancing. Family fun in Southampton this half term included putting on the headphones and dancing like nobody was watching, with West Key hosting their first ever silent disco. Our reporter Adele Bouchard was there on the dance floor. West Key's silent disco took centre stage this half term holiday in Southampton providing sessions all week for any age or music taste. The event follows the centre's plan to become more than just a place to shop. 
it's another experience that we can bring to people. So uh, we want people to be able to come to West Quay and combine like, an experience of say the side of disco with getting something to eat at one of our restaurants, maybe going to the cinema and seeing one of the films that has just come out for half term. Please do you know, have a look around some of the stores have something to eat and enjoy a day out we've also got bowling available um you know so there's there's a full day sort of fun there for families and or students or whoever wants to come down staff at westkey work closely with local charity the rose road association to make the event accessible ensuring families and those with disabilities were all welcome the sign disco here on the upper terrace follows southampton's success in being long listed for the uk city of culture status 2025. Upon arrival, disco goers were welcomed by the teams, who gave them their LED headphones and session wristbands before hitting the dance floor. So Westkey approached us uh, with the idea to do a silent disco, uh, to get footfalls in the area, it's just a fun experience for guests and things like that. So we've been working with suppliers and the team to bring it to life and make it happen. Sessions ran 12 till 9pm throughout the week and had to be pre-booked online, with music slots ranging from 80s classics to R&B and pop party, providing fun for all the family. We're here for like the silent disco because we sure it's gonna be exciting and fun. I had such a good time. It was really, really fun. The music was amazing. Lots of cheesy pop, which is what I needed. West Key are currently working on their 2022 programme and following its success this half term, the Scient Disco team are hopeful they will be back with the Beats next year. Adele Bouchard, Winchester News Online. And finally, the nation's dogs have been under the microscope as many believe that they are struggling to cope, with, cope on their own after an extended period of everyone being at home thanks to the pandemic. Alex Fra Franklin has this one. A dog's behaviour can often hint at their mood. And since the gradual return to normal, there has apparently been an increase in the number of dog owners seeking professional help for their furry friend. I would say that there's definitely been an increase. Um, there's been more of a variety client-wise and interest in the business has definitely picked up. Um, dogs have sort of got used to that attention now whilst everyone was at home over the lockdowns. And unfortunately, there's quite clearly a few that are still struggling to adapt especially those that are maybe younger and didn't really know any different. As owners have begun to return to work, our best friends have been left alone, lacking the human contact that they dearly crave. Obviously, during the pandemic, uh, he had lots more attention, lots more people around. We have much more time to take him out for longer walks. We were sharing that responsibility in our household. But now we're starting to return back to work, uh, university and college it's become much more difficult to have that time, that same amount of time that he's been used to. And we found him sneaking upstairs a few times at night and he knows he's not allowed to do that. But I think that's mainly just to be closer to us and to see that we are still around because I think during the day when we're not, he is missing that contact. Um, we are trying to fill his day as best as we can, but it is much more difficult now that we're all back at work. It seems as though many of our four-legged friends have struggled to adapt to life after lockdown. From where I'm sat though, there's plenty of tail wagging. All it takes is a bit of company. <laughs> Alex Franklin, Winchester News Online. That's all we've got time for today. Thanks for watching and see you next week.